again. I'm here with another video in my new Crohn's series and IBD series, coping with horrible inflammatory bowel disease. Today I wanted to talk about some of the medications I've been on and sort of how they worked or didn't work for me and my journey through a bunch of different medications. Um, my story isn't as long as a lot of other people's. I've been diagnosed for five years, um, coming up on my fifth anniversary, actually. It's funny, around this time, holiday time, December, January, um, even a little bit in November, is my time of the year, really, where I tend to have the most problems. Um, and it's sort of like that for anyone with inflammatory bowel disease, I think. Um, most of the people that I've spoken to or that I know personally who have some form of IBD tend to have a cycle that their disease naturally follows. Some people it's very much triggered by foods. Other people it's a cycle or maybe something about the weather or just what's going on that time of year that really seems to trigger the inflammation and disease process. So I was diagnosed finally with my colonoscopy in 2000. 11 in, oh gosh, it was probably the 10th or something of December, so really just about five years now. And I have been through several different medications, um, some of which we thought were working for a while and turned out not to be because I'd never achieved remission until I was um, prescribed Humira. So I'm going to start with my journey from the beginning, I suppose, is the best way that makes sense. Um, as I mentioned in my previous Crohn's video about my diagnosis, when I was still in recovery after my colonoscopy, my gastroenterologist decided to just prescribe me meds. So a relatively new, or really quite new, I guess, medication at the time was called Entacort. Let me find it. Okay, so... The generic of Entacort is budesonide, AC, budesonide, I think is how you say that. So this is what the bottle looks like, it says budesonide, EC. And this is, it's a corticosteroid, much like prednisone, but it is supposed to just target your digestive tract. So it's very safe in the realm of corticosteroids and it really doesn't have many if any side effects <clears throat> so even without the pathology back from you know my biopsies from the colonoscopy my gastroenterologist decided it was best to just start me on something and because this medication has so few side effects and is really very targeted medication um, that's what we started with. I started with nine milligrams. I think that's fairly um, standard to start with. I think you can increase a little bit, um, but for someone with moderate to severe Crohn's disease, as my doctor could tell just um, visually from my exam, um, yeah, we started with nine. And I was on this until my pathology results came back and I had a follow-up appointment with my gastroenterologist. And I believe it was about a week and a half to two weeks later. And if this had been working for me, it would have had some progress um, by that time. Like I would have been feeling slightly better. I would have known if it was working or not. And I didn't feel any better. Um, now, as I said, also, because the colonoscopy confirmed that I had Crohn's disease, I never ended up going through that first endoscopy in the diagnosis phase. So I could have had Crohn's disease um, basically from your lips all the way through, um, from in to out, basically. And we knew that in my lower digestive tract, basically from my part of my jejunum, mostly my ileum, down, um, I had Crohn's disease. And this basically targets the small intestine, I believe almost exclusively. So if I'd have had Crohn's disease anywhere else in my digestive tract, it wouldn't have helped. 
So we decided at that first follow-up appointment that unfortunately this very safe medication was not going to work for me. So then in order to get the inflammation down, you really need something strong like a corticosteroid. So we went on to everybody's favorite medication, prednisone. Yay. Uh, no. Prednisone is one of those medications where people with Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, I believe arthritis, so many different um, diseases and health issues. People, these, ugh, prednisone, it's a part of your life. You either make friends with it or you do everything in your power to avoid it. And I am in that latter camp. Um, as I spoke about again in my last video, I have really been fortunate. I haven't had to have any, have any major surgeries. And I owe a lot of that to my diet and the fact that if I feel a flare coming on, and I've, I've really also identified a lot of triggers for myself, and I've avoided them like the plague, including dairy. Dairy, dairy is the plague. Um, <laughs> I avoid this stuff, oh, so much. I was on it for two years at really relatively high doses until we found a medication that would work for me. So in conjunction, oh, okay, this, it starts getting crazy here and it's hard for me to even remember what was going on because I was really quite sick. But I was on the prednisone. We decided to put me on the prednisone. We went to a really high dose at first. I cannot remember how high it was. And I was on that for two weeks. And then we were going to introduce a um, maintenance medication along with it, hoping that either the combination or the prednisone getting the inflammation down and then the other medication keeping it down would be enough. Um, so we went on this. It was on really high dose for two weeks. Moon phase couldn't sleep. The insomnia was terrible. I was so hungry all the time. I was angry. I was sad. It was like the worst case of PMS you've ever had. And it just doesn't stop. Um, oh God, the night sweats were terrible. That's what I remember about it the most. Like I'm naturally, I'm always cold, always, always cold. And the fact that I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis severe hypothyroid makes it even worse. My body is really bad at regulating its temperature. I am always cold. The second I laid down that night while I was on this stuff, sweat city. I couldn't sleep because I was hyper anyway, and I was in college, and oh my god, it was terrible. It was terrible. I remember sweating, and I remember... Whew. Okay, so prednisone. I was on it. Well, we introduced my first maintenance medication, which I don't know, a prezo. I can't remember the generic of this. I'm sure there is one, but I remember this was one of the more expensive medications that could have been, but again, very, very safe. A prezo, I believe, is used more for people with ulcerative colitis, or UC, the other major inflammatory bowel disease, as it works best targeted in the colon, um, a lot of with along with a lot of suppository medications for UC treatment. Um, but yeah, started on four of these. I can show you what they look like. They're giant. You take four of these a day. Giant, horse pills, giant. Um, and it's a maintenance medication. So I was on these in conjunction for a while. And when I started tapering down of this, which you have to taper so that your kidneys can take control again, of the inflammation and this stuff does everything. It's, it's so terrible. It's so terrible for your body. Oh, especially as a future dietitian, like prednisone is a no-no unless you need it. Whereas it can be like life-saving basically. On the aprizo ended up, oh, misalamine. It says right there. I'm an idiot. Okay. It's misalamine. That's what I thought, but I wasn't sure and I didn't want to say. Um, so I was on these. Started tapering down the prednisone, didn't feel better. Felt worse because the inflammation was going back up. The aprizo was not working for me. Went back up on the prednisone again. And then we introduced, where is it? I got so many medications, you guys. And I'm not in the habit of keeping all of them, but I guess it's a good thing I did so I could make this video. 
Um, and then <laughs> I was on these two in conjunction. I don't know if you can read azathioprine. This is generic for imurin. And I was on four of these a day. I can show you what these look like. In conjunction while I'm still taking the aprizo. Because maybe we think all three of them together or maybe these two without the prednisone will work. Because this is such a safe medication. So this is what the azathioprine looks like. Not so bad. But think about you're taking four of these and you're taking four of those big blue pills every day. Plus the prednisone until you can taper off of it. <sighs> so start tapering down on this again. Realize, okay, well, you're starting to feel a little bit better. So you play around with the dose of these guys. I believe maybe I started on two and then I went to four. I'm not sure. Um, wasn't feeling super well. Taper, you know, dosage changing. Go back up on this for a little while and make sure the inflammation gets down and stays down. Lock onto a you know, treatment dose of this while taking these, <laughs> and then realize that these aren't doing anything, so I can finally stop taking them. Still taking these two, tapering down on this one, and I'm feeling all right. I'm doing okay for a little while. And I finally get off of these completely, and it was the middle of summer, I remember, when I got off of these, because I got off of these a couple of weeks, the prednisone, sorry, a couple of weeks after my graduation from college. So this would have been 2012. I've been on these for almost two years at this point, basically two years. That's not right. When was I diagnosed? No, it must have been 2010, so it's been six years, because it was my first year in Oregon after being super, super sick and humbled. Okay, so six years. I've been diagnosed for six years. I don't know what's going on with me. It seems like a lifetime. It has been a lifetime. So much has changed. Um, anyway, so thinking I'm doing all right on this. And then, so it must be the end of 2012. I go back in for an MRI because I'm not feeling good. December. I believe, I can't remember if that MRI was the one that was Christmas Eve or if it was the next year. I don't remember. I had two of them basically one year after another. And I could talk about MRIs later on too, but that barium solution is terrible. It's so terrible. It's awful. The barium solution for CT scans, better. CT is so much shorter. If you can get away with one or the other, do a CT. Five minutes, in, out. MRI. You have to drink more barium, and it's like a 45-minute scan, and you can't move, and you have to hold your breath. It's terrible. Anyway, now, at this point in 2012, after I graduated, sometime in August, I believe, I'm just on the azathioprine four-day, which makes that 200 milligrams, and flash forward, it's December, starting to not feel so good, don't really know, like, what's going on, and... Um, just not feeling so great. And I go in and I have an MRI and it shows bowel wall thickening, which is basically inflammation in the Crohn's disease. You have inflammation all the way through the layers of the bowel wall. And that is really, it blocks you from absorbing a lot of things. Your digestive digestion obviously is really impaired. Um, and so at that point, it's like, we got to do something else. So we bring in the big guns. Azathioprine is a that's azathioprine is an immunosuppressant. And basically, while you're on this drug and most other immunosuppressants, you know, you're like, do not get pregnant. Be very careful. Wash your hands. Get a flu shot um, before you can even start on immunosuppressants, especially the really big guns like Humira. Um, Oh my gosh, why can't I think of the other one? Remicade. And there's a new one out that I can't remember what it's called. So it's an E. You have to go through and you have to be tested for immunity to make sure that you're immune to the things that you should have gotten shots for as a kid and boosters. So um, the big one is Hep B. And then you have to go through and get this like four-step TB test to make sure you have no T inactive TB in your body. 
um, that could flare up when your immune system goes down. So I've had some testing for this, and then I have more testing because we're like, now we need the really big guns, which is Humira. This is a pen. This is mine that I have to take today. Obviously, it's mine. Um, comes like this. It's a pen, so you don't have to drop your own medication and into a syringe like you would for um, a lot of things like insulin. Um, insulin's also come in a pen, which is awesome. I believe there's a similar medication to this, or maybe you can get the Humira in the syringe form. Um, but the pen is much easier. You don't have to look at the needle. It goes in and out all by itself. You just have to count to 10 um, and make sure the little, there's a, like a little orange or yellow stopper in here and you just need to make sure it goes all the way down. Um, you have to check every time, turn it upside down and inside out and you can see this window right here and you have to make sure the medication is clear and it's full and um, yeah. And anyway, the reason mine is out of the fridge right now is that my number one tip for Humira is to let it warm up. Now, I believe that these these are supposed to be stored in the fridge. I keep mine in the little butter thing so it doesn't get jostled around, it doesn't get lost in the back of the fridge, and it's always there to remind me every two weeks to take it, which is the maintenance dose for Humira's. Take one syringe subcutaneously every two weeks. And yeah, warm it up. Stay off the fridge for 24 hours, warm it up before you take it anywhere from 20 minutes to a couple of hours maybe. Um, maybe you're going to run to the grocery store and you're going to take it when you get home. Just take it out, set it on the counter, um, set it next to your big old shirts container um, before you go to the store. Then when you come back from the store, it's ready to go. And um, the way they come is like this. In a pack for a maintenance dose, you get two syringes. Open it like this. One syringe, two syringe. So I have to take this one two weeks from today. Um, taking this one today. And my second tip is they come with, if I can find them, two little alcohol wipes. Warm these up also. Okay, they don't need to be in the fridge. They can be off of the fridge. And warm it up so it's not freezing when it goes on your leg or in your stomach. And <laughs> pick a spot on your body where you're going to do it in your arm or in your, in your stomach or in your leg and clean it and let it dry. Alcohol works by evaporation anyway. So you don't want to be injecting through wet alcohol. Plus, if you're injecting through wet alcohol, it stings like nothing else. So the needle is tiny. It hurts a little. hurts a little when the medication goes in. Not too bad. The worst pain is if you go through wet alcohol. Ouch. Don't do it. Pick a spot, clean it, don't touch it, and then inject when it's dry. Okay? So anyway, when I start on the Humira, I'm also taking azathioprine, taking them together, taking two immunosuppressant medications at fairly high doses. Um, the Humira, you get a starter pack with six, four in one day, um, two, two weeks later, and then generally from then on, you're on a maintenance dose. Yeah, so when I first go in the Humira, I'm taking both. And then I believe I'm on the two of them for a year together, a year and a half, something like that. It was at least a year. And then I felt remarkably better, remarkably, like night and day. And I believe it's due to taking both of them together and really getting my body into a place where the inflammation is gone. And then during that time, especially because I'm, I'm afraid to go outside, frankly, taking both of these medications together. Like, I don't want to get sick and die. No, thank you. I don't want to go in the hospital. So really, I shut myself in, which, you know, I'm depressed at this point anyway. So it's going to happen. I'm going to shut myself inside. And um, I really like lay down the law with myself to make sure that I that I know what I'm getting myself into as far as diet and exercise and like how can I be my healthiest self. So um, and with supplements also. So I'm gonna make a separate video about supplements 
and another video about alternative therapies, exercises, things that I do to help de-stress, things that I do when I'm just sick and like, I don't want to see another person because, oh my God, like I feel terrible and just get away from me. Um, that video would probably be good for anyone with chronic disease. Like, you know how it feels when you don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to leave the house. You don't want to get out of bed. And like, you might not be super depressed, but your body is. And that sucks. So um, we can talk about that in another video. So just a couple more med things I want to touch on. Um, sleeping, uh, sleep. So, especially with the prednisone and then with, for me with anxiety, sleep sucks. And I've had insomnia since just before I started taking my thyroid medication. I was 12 at the time. I'm 23 or 25. I can't talk today. I'm 25. So that's 13 years that I've had insomnia. And um, when I first went on the prednisone at pretty high doses, my doctor asked me if I thought I might have trouble sleeping. I already had trouble sleeping. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so he prescribed me Zolpidem, which is Ambien. And uh, I believe these are 10 mil, yeah, 10 mil tablets. And you can cut them in half if you don't want. Make sure you don't take them every day. If you get prescribed these, take them when you need it. Take a half, take as small of a dose as you can. You can even take a quarter of one um, if you just need that help to get into sleep. And, you know, don't take them on the weekends if you can get away with not sleeping or if weekends you sleep better anyway because maybe you're a little bit less stressed um, because you have something big coming up the next day. And uh, don't get hooked on them. It sucks to come off of them if you don't have a doc who's nice and keeps prescribing them, but most people shouldn't keep taking them anyway. And let's see. So I also take, um, right now I'm taking Armour Thyroid and Levothyroxine for my thyroid problems because I'm a problem. I've always been on super high doses. My antibodies are still really high, which sucks. And then the last thing, I'm also on Trazodone and Celexa for other issues. Trazodone is also great to help you sleep if you take it at a low dose, which I believe would be 50 milligrams. Um, it doesn't have any of the antidepressant qualities. It just helps you sleep. Really, it, it knocks you out. So if you take trazodone for something else like an antidepressant or for anxiety, then it will also help you sleep and you don't need the uh, Ambien, hopefully. And then the last thing besides Oh, I was going to talk about Imodium, or I wrote myself a note because I ran out of it, Loperamide, which is the drug name for Imodium, which is an antidiarrheal. I've heard conflicting things. Most people say that, you know, if you have Crohn's or another um, IBD type disease that causes diarrhea, it's not a problem to take loperamide or Imodium. Um, just don't take it every day. You know, maybe you're going on vacation and you want to make sure that you can make it through the day um, or you get traveler's diarrhea. Like that's generally what it's for, traveler's diarrhea. Um, you can take it. You can take one or two a day. Just don't take it every day. Don't make it part of your regimen because your body, it's not good for someone who already has issues with digestion. Yeah, so just be careful with it. But if you need it for a special occasion or vacation or a holiday or something like coming up, take one or two that day and then try not to do it anymore. Um, especially if you're in a big flare. Like just your body needs to heal. You don't need to be throwing other drugs at it. And then with Crohn's disease, because bleeding is a risk, you cannot take any NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is a mouthful. So that would be your ibuprofen, your naproxen sodium, or Aleve Motrin. Can't remember what the other one is called. You cannot take those, and you cannot take aspirin or things that have a lot of willow bark in them because those are basically anticoagulants, and we don't need that. We don't need more blood going away, especially when people with 
diarrhea and people who don't want to drink a lot of water because they feel like it's just going to come out or they're super tired anyway and water is an enemy. You get super dehydrated and you don't need to lose more blood out of your body than you need to. So don't take them. What you need to take is acetaminophen. Now, this junk, acetaminophen doesn't work for a lot of people. It just doesn't. But when you're in Canada and you can combine it with a little bit of codeine, much better. So if you're in Canada or other places in the world where you don't need a prescription for codeine, it's a lifesaver, especially for someone who gets migraines. Like migraines, nothing helps migraines except sleep. And that's what we got the trazodone and the Ambien for. But sometimes, or maybe if you stub your toe and it's bleeding or you know, you fall and dislocate your ankle like I did. <laughs> this stuff is much better and it won't interfere with your Crohn's or UC or other bleeding disorder. So keep that in mind. Try and keep something on hand. If the regular good old Tylenol acetaminophen stuff works for you, that's great. Um, also, the migraine ones that have caffeine in them. <sighs> caffeine can be a huge trigger for a lot of things, not just IBD, but especially for IBD, um, be very careful with caffeine. Don't use it where you don't need it. If you do have a migraine and you want the acetamin, uh, acetaminophen and caffeine mix, go for it. Um, but don't if you don't have to. It's just one of those things. Like Right now I'm having tea, but it's herbal. So why am I having tea, you ask, if there's no caffeine? Because it's warm. And it feels good. So I believe that's all. Um, people with Crohn's also have joint problems, which is where, you know, your pain reliever will come in. But I sometimes have to tape up my ankles because they get super weak and like arthritis -y. And I also have these puppies. One for each wrist. I love these. They're cheap. You can get them on Amazon. Green. Mueller. They work really well. They don't smell yet, and I've had them for a while, and I don't think I've washed them, which is really gross. Um, you know, just keep things like this on hand. You, obviously, you don't want to wear them every day because you want to keep your joints and muscles moving and working. Um, but if you need a little help, especially if you're prone to dropping things, I'm looking at me and <laughs> my camera screen. I'm accusing myself. Um, keep things like this on hand. They're really nice. They alleviate some of that pain um, from arthritis and some tape, you know, if you need to tape up a joint or something to make it stronger for a day. Um, if you need to walk a lot or something and your ankles are weak or your feet, uh, things like that. My hips are a big problem. My back is a terrible problem. Um, but I'm going to talk about all that stuff in alternative therapies. So this was a very long video. Again, I'm sorry. I hope all the Crohn's ones aren't this long. I've got ideas for two more Crohn's videos, but I can keep going if um, these videos start reaching people who need them. Otherwise, it's really nice for me to talk about it because obviously I've learned a lot of things about myself that I've forgotten. Like, it's been six years, not five. Where did a whole year go? Um, probably the tears on my bed. That's where it went. That was depressing. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to end this video now. I hope this really helps someone. Um, Share it if you can. Put it on forums. That's I think I'm going to try and put it on as many forums as I can. And Anyway, <laughs> have a good day, everyone. Happy holidays.